Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. I've got a great episode today. I'm speaking with Larry Kramer. He is the president of the Heal It Foundation, and we're having a conversation about America after neoliberalism. Neoliberalism being the set of economic policies and assumptions about what common sense actually looks like in the econ field in the 1980s and 1990s. There's a whole set of issues we cover on this show, everything from economic resiliency to supply chains and a bunch of other topics that are going to fit under this post-neoliberalism bucket. So, I thought it'd be fun to kind of take the opportunity to look at the overall idea and the frame, which will then make other episodes we do that are a little more niche down and its specific issues make more sense. So hope you all are having a great summer and you enjoy this conversation. Larry Kramer, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to chat with you in this format. So here's the idea for the conversation I wanted to have with this episode. We are little more than a year out of the 2024 election, November 2024. And so much of how I've considered this podcast in this space has been framed around big debates around economic policy, conversations about capitalism. You've written pieces relating to that debate. But something that got me thinking when I read some of the Axios reporting around uh, President Biden's frustrations with his own team is, is that apparently um, there's been a little too much uh, acronyms, a little too much uh, highfalutinness. So if we're going to have a conversation about neoliberalism, I'd love to have you start by doing your best attempt at just grounding the big capitalism conversation within everyday experiences that people are having right now. Sure. I think that's actually really easy. Um, so what we call neoliberalism is basically a way of seeing the world that has three components. And I should say any and all of these paradigms, because they shift over time, have some version of the same three paradigms. At one end is a conception of the nature of society and the individual. And for neoliberalism, the conception is that society consists of individuals, that there isn't a society as such other than the aggregation of individual actors. And that individuals basically are motivated by trying to do what they can to improve their lives or theirs and their families. Um, so, uh, you know, in that formal language, they're trying to maximize their utility, but that's really what we mean. They're doing their best to make their own lives better. And at the other end is the conception of what you are trying to achieve as a society. And for neoliberalism, that conception at the other end is growth, right? More is better. Let's generate wealth. Let's generate the things that make lives better for people. And the middle piece is how, given the first piece, you get to the third piece, right? And so neoliberalism basically says the best way for individuals who are competing to make their lives better to generate the most of what makes people's lives better is through markets. Free markets defined in a particular way, meaning governments limited to essentially encasing markets, <laughs> enabling the private enterprise system to do what it does. That's basically neoliberalism. And I guess the question here would be, if you look at the world today, what aspects of our society that you would say are unoptimal, to even use some uh, neoliberal language, uh, would you say are the result of this conceptualization, individual markets growth? Well, I don't know that you can say sort of what percentage or whatever, but um, I think all three pieces are fundamentally not wrong in the sense of 100% wrong. Like that would be crazy, but our, but fundamentally don't fit the society we have today. So first, you know, the 20th century sort of framed it as there was either individuals or some kind of collective society thing that existed outside of any individual of which we were victims. And I think neither of those things are true, that we are, of course, individuals, but as individuals, we define ourselves as through, through our participation in groups, many different groups, right? I am... I'm, you know, I have a geographical identity. I have a, a racial identity. I have a religious identity. I have a, a members of, you know, different kinds. But, but, and I have a political community. So we are parts of communities and we define ourselves in that way. And we don't want to just do well for ourselves at the expense of everybody else. We actually want to see all of the people in our communities do well. So to some extent, there's competition between communities. But a lot of it also is just like we want mutualism. We want we want to do well, and we want I want you to do well. And how do we do that? And at the other end, you know, the idea of growth, period, is is a is a really morally unattractive 
goal. I think there was implicit in a lot of the neoliberal thinking that it would be growth that would be distributed in a good way. And that just hasn't proved to be true uh, for lots of reasons that I think have been demonstrated with empirical evidence and so on, that there's a, a built-in tendency, you know, uh, if you think of Thomas Piketty's work, that returns to capital just systematically and consistently outstrip returns to labor. And so you get a massive shift from, you know, labor to capital holders and oh, blah, 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 blah. But the point being, just growth alone is not a terribly normatively attractive goal for your society, that we want two things. We want a growth that is more justly distributed. We actually, part of mutualism, we want we want everybody to get some of it. And I don't want all of it for me if that means that you get none. So we really do care about the distribution of wealth. And second, um, we want opportunity. And now neoliberals would have said they want opportunity too, but the way they defined opportunity was government is out of your way. And that would be great if we were all in the same starting positions and we all had exactly the same capacities and so on. But to have a real opportunity in this society, there are things you need that we have to make sure you're provided with. An education, healthcare, housing, and the basic necessaries of life. You know, it's important that they have those. And that's society's obligation. And then you look at the middle piece and what we say is, so a system that is so focused on free markets alone doesn't fit either of those ends. So we need to think differently. We're not going to get rid of markets. We're still looking, I think we're still looking at a system that's built fundamentally on free enterprise because free enterprise has enormous benefits that have we've realized in terms of generating innovation, in terms of generating opportunities for people to succeed. But but a, a free enterprise system, you know, like sort of let run rampant has downsides. So we have to think about how do we mix mix and match a role for government, a role for civil society, a role for different norms developments than norms that celebrate the individual's achievement at the expense of everybody else, that celebrate massive aggregations of wealth at the, at the, you know, so we can think differently about all those tools and with the belief that we're trying to help each other and that what we want is real opportunities, you know, so it's that kind of thing. And we, we are very far from that world. So I think a lot of it can be laid at the feet of an approach that has crippled our ability to use tools other than free other than free markets, although not so much. So now we do use government and we use it badly, right? Because it's the thumbs on the scale against it and the justifications twisted around and and that you know have a different set of norms than the ones that we've come to celebrate and so on. So I think you know you can't attribute a percentage, but we do need to fundamentally reorient if we really want to produce a better society. Yeah, and when you were giving that answer around um, healthcare, housing, those different categories, a huge part of the 20th century answer to that question was that's what growth is for in the first place. If we have growth, we have more wealth. If more wealth, you're going to have healthcare, food insecurity, all those different areas uh, really addressed. So when we're talking about growth as a part of the neoliberal project, it seems that pushing away from that just feels... To, it, it 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 doesn't feel like pushing away from it. Nobody's pushing away from it. So when what are we what are we what are we what are we doing with the growth angle? It's just Everyone... not growth alone. We have okay. to think about how do we produce a growth that is distributed well, and how do we do it in a way that gives everybody an opportunity to have some of it. So you know the focus on GDP as mm -hmm. the measure of how well we're doing in our economic policy, and GDP done in a way that treats you know say a drug that causes cancer is the same as a drug that cures it. That's that's what produces bad consequences. So yes, of course we want we we want to produce the things that make for a better life, but we want to do it in a way because we care about mutuality that is shared somewhat and that that gives people, regardless of their starting position, what they need to have an opportunity to get there, a real one and not just a formal one. Something I'm curious about is the resiliency of the neoliberal paradigm. You have the origins in the 1970s is something you've written about, but you've had multiple events over the course of the early 21st century, 2008 financial crisis, the COVID pandemic, a lot of the fallout from that, that one thinks would have caused a broader rethinking of that paradigm. What explains its resiliency over this period? So I don't think it's resilient. I think it's collapsing around us now. I think it's dead and dying, but it hasn't been replaced yet. And that's not unique to neoliberalism. It's neither more nor less resilient than other paradigms have been. Neoliberalism replaced, you know, a Keynesian paradigm that itself arose, you know, in the 1940s. 
uh, Keynesianism replaced, you know, uh, the sort of laissez-faire paradigm that itself arose in the mid-late 19th century, which itself replaced mercantilism. And what happens is each of these paradigms sort of, it fits, you know, paradigm isn't, it's not right or wrong. This is really important for people to understand. Um, it's an explanation that helps people order a really complex mm -hmm. world that lets them know which ideas make sense and which ones don't. Now, the paradigm doesn't fully control everything because there's so many other things that go into the ultimate outcomes, political power, serendipity of events, the quality of advocates, all sorts of things. So the light world is always messy, but it helps organize and so works as a heavy thumb on the scale in favor of some things and against others. And while it works, it survives and then it starts to break down and it doesn't break down instantly for everybody. It, more and more people begin to lose faith until the center of gravity is gone. So neoliberalism didn't start, you know, didn't start in the 70s with stagflation. It started in the 30s. The idea is it was the next evolution of laissez-faire, right? But it lost out to Keynesianism because people didn't believe that it was the right way to deal with things like the Great Depression and the consequences of World War I. And they adopted a system that said, you know, government does have an important role managing the economy. And what we're trying to do with our society, though, is we want to do that and then we want a safety net to catch the people who fail. That was the kind of Keynesian paradigm as it evolved. And that worked for a long time and institutions were built and they were pretty solid. And, you know, things went really well from like 1945 to 1975 or so. But that paradigm started breaking down in the late 60s and early 70s. And stagflation was a result of the economy had changed, right? And those managing institutions weren't managing well and people lost faith. And there were competitors. I mean, neoliberalism was out there, but so were some radical left alternatives. But the one that made sense to people that they adopted, partly because of the way the ideas fit, partly because there were great advocates like Reagan or Thatcher. Um, and so they were able to begin to implement policies. And those seem to work for people too, right? I mean, you know, Reagan takes over in 80, Thatcher in 79, and interest rates come down, and unemployment comes down, you know, it's like, but over time, it has not worked in some ways and generated some real problems. And as in the early, more and more people have lost faith in, they don't lose faith in the paradigm. That's not how ordinary people think about things. They think about the institutions that embody it. And people have lost faith in those institutions and they begin to drift. They look for the next best explanation. So as I said, in the 1970s, there were alternatives and some people did drift to the far left alternatives. Most ended up on neoliberalism. In the 1930s, when laissez-faire broke down, a lot of people became communists. A lot of people became fascists. Those were viable alternatives. What we're looking at today is the breakdown of neoliberalism has happened or is happening really fast and people are drifting. And that explains, you know, what are the what are the alternatives? There's China and that has a lot of appeal in many parts of the world, which is essentially state run capitalism without individual rights um, and what I'll call ethno-nationalism, which is a kind of 21st century version of fascism. And we're seeing a lot of that, you know, and there are mild versions in some countries and really extreme versions in others. So, you know, you have an Orban, you have a Modi, you have a Bolsonaro, you know, Trump. And but it's not just on the right, you know, the appeal. That's why I say it's the appeal of Sanders and that side. So you're seeing a shift in the way people are thinking and what, whatever people are, they've lost faith in that side of institutions and they're looking for something different. So one version says there was a glorious past and there was a you know, more of a national culture. And if we can recapture that, we can begin to rebuild. And what we need to do is shut down and shut out the things that have complicated and messed it up. Um, and that has appealed to lots and lots of people, right? Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, the China side of things because this brings to mind something that doesn't happen as much in the post-neoliberalism conversations, which is the foreign policy environment. Um, I'm So the thing is, like, I speak to a lot of, uh, you know, think tank, policy thinkers on the right. And what's been fascinating to me is seeing how a lot of conversations that have um, come from the competition with China conversation have pushed folks into post-neoliberal thinking in a way that just wasn't true necessarily. So for example, if you go to any conservative think tank and you say the words industrial policy, there'll be just deep dismissive skepticism. But if you follow up and say, okay, what do we do about chip manufacturing? What do we do about vaccine supply chains? They'll instantly say, oh, well, that's different. So that's kind of an example of how the foreign policy side of things is shifting the thinking. I'm curious how, from your perspective, if you're seeing that conversation um, from your angles. 
So yes, and again, there's not one exclusive thing. I mean, there are many streams, but one of the streams always has been, think of it as international economic policy. So again, a quick history, the push against mercantilism and the rise of laissez-faire in the mid 19th century, which started in the United States was very much, we needed to deal with then it was England and France and their dominance in international um, economic relations. And it was, it was, it made sense for what we were trying to do as a better way for American economic policy to develop, to fuel the kind of growth um, that we wanted and needed. You know, the breakdown of laissez-faire and the rise of Keynesianism um, was obviously hugely tied in then to, you know, the fight first to the fight against fascism, but more importantly, against communism. Mm -hmm. And of course, the breakdown of neoliberalism and the uptake uh, of the breakdown in Keynesianism and the uptake in neoliberalism was driven by that very much by that same competition, mostly because changes took place in the international economic order as Germany and Japan reemerged. We didn't understand the extent to which the Keynesian policy actually, inter, you know, in terms of international economics, depended on a kind of U.S. dominance that was suddenly being challenged by the rise of these other other economic powers and as things to end the oil shock, right, as, as OPEC emerges. So all those things sort of created circumstances in which neoliberalism is very much about addressing them and communism. And, and the same thing is true today, right? The free trade regime that was generated by neoliberalism has had consequences inside the U.S., left lots of people behind and out that were not expected or understood, but that are very much drivers of the abandonment of that way of thinking about it. So it's still, you know, both Trump and Biden, there's lots of similarities in their international economic policies um, and, and certainly in what they're sort of trying to correct for. Yeah, you know, something I'm interested in going back to one of your earlier answers is to what degree does a post neoliberal conversation kind of skew our understandings of left and right when it comes to political coalitions? The key thing about all these paradigm changes is they redefine what left and right is. They're always accompanied by realignment. It is the nature of it because they're changing the grounds on which you know the left-right axis has developed within a paradigm. And as the paradigm changes, the left-right axis, you may have left-right, they're not always the same, but it's you know the different sides. So so you know you see that there's splits within the Democratic coalition, there's splits within the Republican coalition. That you know, some of them are a product of, and they seem to many people to be a product of just the day to day controversies that we're having. But they reflect very different worldviews, and you know, you would get that realignment. I mean, the the Democratic Party that FDR put together, which was a Keynesian paradigm, as it breaks down, you know, what they called Reagan Democrats were you know people for whom that way of working things didn't work, and they were found more appealing the opportunities that seemed to be available than the than Republican. Um, platform, which is, of course, very far removed from today's Republican platform, which itself reflects some of these shifts. So you you expect realignment. We're in one of those periods, as in the 20s and 30s, as in the late 60s, early 70s, of, of turmoil, because nothing has settled. So the breakdown is what we're in the middle of. Um, things will eventually settle, and it will be a different left-right. Something I'm curious about is the ethno-nationalism issue you brought up, which seems to me um, at the core of the ideological awkwardness when it comes to these projects, in the sense that some of the most post-neoliberal right-wingers I know open to different conceptions of the good, different uh, conceptions of how government should operate, are also deeply ethno-nationalist, because often part of the way that they get to the answer of we should reconceive our economic conceptions is there is a specific set of people who are specific sets of Americans, and they've been ill-served the exclusions of people like outside that tribe and community. So can you talk about the awkwardness of this uh, dynamic when things go turn into a culture war area? You know, it's, I mean, it's particularly challenging to talk about it in the American context. So let me put that aside for a moment. We'll come back to it. But if you think globally, remember most, the United States is somewhat unique in that it was, it was defined around ideas, not around a shared, you know, a shared cultural or ethnic past in the same way that most other countries were. So in a lot of these countries, then the expression of it is, is fairly called ethno nationalism because it's people thinking like, who are the real English? Who are the real French? Who are the real, you know, whatever Indians? 
Um, and then and then defining the threat as coming from the people who are not that, who have challenged the, the culture and economy and society that was built around it and wanting to restore it. So you can put blame there and you can look for policies that restore the dominance of that group. So I, I think that is an actual fair description in the U.S., but it, it is definitely sort of more cultural and ideological and intellectual. The part where it gets, you know, frankly uncomfortable is it, it unquestionably though also does map onto race, which is the one place where this gets super complicated for people and that makes it so uncomfortable to talk about. Um, and, you know, it goes beyond that because it's not just about race, but it is clearly about race very much. And the, the question of what it means to have a multiracial, multicultural society on the one hand versus it's not that people, you know, I think don't, you know, there, the, there are like the far right nuts who, you know, have this notion of replacement and it should actually only be white people in this country. But that's not most of what we're doing, but it, that's why it is cultural. But the, the culture that they want is a harkening back to a kind of culture that was much more racialized um, in, in operation, right? In which, you know, the, the groups truly were marginal. And and again, it's not that they want to necessarily. So so the way it plays out, the way it's understood, the way the policies play out, the kinds of steps that people want to take, where they're just not as focused on redressing the consequences of of all that, you know, formal de jure, deep cultural racism. You know, it's all wrapped up in this. Um, but to me, it, it, it at the end of the day, it's still similar in that there's a notion, the solution to the mess that today feels like is to recapture a kind of culture that we have that worked. And that's what we need to do. And all these challenges to it, all these things that are disrupting it, they're the problem. And if we can just solve that problem, so we don't want these immigrants, right? We don't, even though America's lived on immigrants and, and, you know, we, anyway, you see the idea. Yeah. Something I'm really interested in is your kind of intellectual theory of the case when it comes to how new economic paradigms spread. And because of, this is actually based on just literal history, this is, we don't even have to like sort of hypothesize or like theorize into nothingness. Um, because if you look at how these conversations were really returned in the 1930s and 1940s, um, there's a lot of funders, there are think tanks um, on the Democratic Party side, slash on the left, you have groups like the Democratic Leadership Council that like very um, top down, like could set agendas that way. Um, a defining reality of the current moment is just a deep distrust in institutions, establishments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it would be much harder to have the group meet up and then disseminate. Um, how do you... Would you agree with that characterization of like the differences between the 30s, 40s, 50s, um, and today? And like, to what degree would you say that's a um, impact on the ability to spread new ideas? Um, I think I would agree, um, and it has a big impact. It's not the mistrust in elite institutions that's characteristic of all paradigm shifts through whose faith in the existing institutions. The 1930s, you say it out loud, you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but but that there, but that there were still institutions that people did trust and through which you could work. And we're in a particular period now where it feels like actually people have lost faith in all of the institutions. And that's pretty scary. Um, and I think that's a product. Um, mostly uh, the world is different. The media environment, the communications environment, access to ideas, the mediation of ideas is so vastly different than it has been at any earlier time. Um, and that has enabled the sort of um, erosion of it's hard to be any institution and not have these massive kinds of attacks that undermine credibility uh, in it. So so that is a that is a challenge. Um, I'm not sure in the end if it's a fatal challenge because I, I personally have a kind of abiding faith that if, if a set of ideas does emerge uh, that actually speaks to people, we're still an open enough society that it will get out there and people would begin to align around it. New institutions will emerge and institutions are not being the formal institutions, Congress being more informal institutions, whether it's political parties or movement groups, but that will really attract the kind of support and then we'll rebuild that way. Um, and, and, you know, so it's more complicated, but I don't think it's impossible because as I say, at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's people, people are looking for explanations that work for them. And, you know, they're out there and, and, you know, and, and as are the means for communication, it's just a much noisier, messier world. Something I'm curious about, just given the fact that you were a dean of 
um, Stanford Law School and you lead a major foundation today. So you are very much at the center of these institutions that are under um, challenge from you know above and, and below at the same time. Like, What would your advice be for leaders in those positions during a moment like this? Well, first, by the way, I think all institutions are under that kind of, I can't think of any that aren't at the point. So it's not just, actually it's foundations. We, foundations in the nonprofit sector has more trust than most when you think about the larger public. Uh, despite attacks, you know, from both the left and the right on on what we do, universities uh, I think have a challenge. They've been under assault for about thirty years, and they haven't really tried to defend themselves. I think it's a long time you can think of, you know, the kind of public intellectual university leadership that has made the value proposition for what universities do as critically as imp important as that is. So, you know, I think it's different for different institutions. If, I think for universities. They need not just individuals, but they really need to like make the case for what they do and why it's so important. And and they need to, you know, to do it. And it, as I say, explain it to people. And they just haven't been doing that for a really long time. Um, and I think there are reasons that's a different conversation about the changes that have taken place in the economics of universities and how they manage to make that work. Um, so it's a sort of institution by institution. I think for foundations, the key has, is and what I would say is to be totally transparent about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So the, the thing that would be a legitimate challenge would be you sit as this big aggregation of wealth with the power to do things. And of course, our independence is an important part of what enables us to do it and the pluralism of the foundation world, in fact. But that only works if we say, and here's what we're doing and criticize us if you think it's wrong. And we will actually listen. We, may, we will still make our own decisions at the end of the day, but we're not isolating ourselves and sitting in some back room deciding everybody's fate, you know? Mm -hmm. So transparency and communication, I think, are pivotal for this sector. But, you know, I mean, you know, different sectors have different different issues and they just need to do the best they can in addressing them. Broadly speaking, we need to find some way to um, get an information media environment that isn't all noise and, uh, you know, uh, all extreme information that whole propaganda. There's a you know a huge amount of propaganda. What amounts to propaganda that people have been martyred with that we need to do something about. It didn't used to be the case because of the structure of media in the say mid late twentieth century. I mean, here's an interesting point. If you think about the nineteenth century, the media environment was as bad or worse than anything we have today. Mm -hmm. But although we were formally democratic, there was still an enormous amount of deference to the leadership class which you know, didn't go for the crazy things and to which people were willing to defer even when they'd been bombarded with all this crazy stuff. As we became more legitimately democratic in the you know, 20th century, particularly after World War I, so people stopped deferring so much and they like thought they should have more of a voice. Um, we also stumbled into a media environment though where the information people were getting was largely centrist. Some organizations leaned to the left, some a little right, Maybe some more leaned a little left than a little right, but they were all pretty much centrist, and that's and that enabled us to you know continue to to work even as people became more insistent that their own voice be heard. And then what's happened in the last forty or fifty years is, you know, if anything, we've become even more democratic. People even less willing to defer to anybody else. But the information environment has gone, you know, fragmented and gone crazy. And so that, not surprisingly, has created a lot of the problems we're looking at. We need to solve that as a problem um, if we want. You can't have a democratic society when the society itself is this fragmented. Something I'm curious about then is when you were bringing up um, the university system and institutions, um, you just got me thinking about um, meritocracy, another um, phenomenon that like rose up during that post-World War II um, Keynesian era. And I'm sure you are aware that there's now a, a cottage industry of, of, of very serious books that critique modern conceptions and notions of meritocracy. I'm curious, do you think this conversation about what a post-meritocratic society um, looks like, are, are they tied into this post-neoliberalism conversation or are these just sometimes interesting phenomenon or dynamics happen at the same time we're having conversations with these two different areas? I, I don't know. I don't have the strong views on that debate, only in the sense that it feels to me a little bit like there's a lot of straw person -ish stuff happening. So like 
it wasn't post-World War II that the idea that accomplishment should matter and that ability should matter. That's always been the case. And then the question, which is open to challenge, is how do we, what are the qualities that we're looking for? And how fairly do we, you know, give people access to get this one I talked about earlier with opportunity? How fair are we about giving people the opportunity to acquire those things? And so you know, achieve and get the benefits then of achievement. Nobody, I don't think anybody is saying actually we shouldn't care about accomplishment or achievement, you know, and, and so on. So then it gets all caught up in, like I say, a lot of word salad and a lot of people are actually focusing on a particular issue and not quite naming it, you know, rightly. So if you, so it's caught up in what we're talking about in the piece of what I said, which is about making sure that people have real opportunities. So if you haven't had the opportunity to get a, a good education, you should, that you, we, should, we have to give you that opportunity, not punish you while not having given you that opportunity. If you want to call that meritocracy, you know, that, that's, I, that's fine. Now, there's a different issue, though, which I do think, which is the equation of merit with grades and test scores for education, I've always thought was a mistake. Um, and the idea that public education, that education isn't a public good. It's a mistake. So I start from the position of the public that education is a public good. We educate people, and then what they can do or do do is for the good of society as a whole. That's why we care about education. It's not just about not just about giving every individual the the chance to do well for themselves, but by virtue of that, having the whole society do better. And so, you know, um, the education needs to be available to the whole society. And if you're constructing a class for a school, you want it to look like the society that you're educating people for. And it certainly should reflect all the major social divisions. I mean, that's what you're trying to get people to do. So to take the recent Supreme Court decision, the idea that race shouldn't be a factor in constructing a class is itself crazy, a product of having started with some desiccated notion that the allocation of education should be based on grades and test scores. And not just race, right? Political ideology, geography, faith or not. I mean, think of the major divisions within our society. I want to build a class that that's what diversity is for. It's not just for the individual students. It's so that the public good that we're producing reflects the public for which we're producing it. Then it's important that the people, you don't want to let somebody into an environment where they're going to fail. So there is a, a threshold you need to get over, but that threshold leaves you with a lot of people within which you want to construct a class that reflects the society. That's that's how I think about education, and I think how we should. We flipped it on its head somewhere along the way, and it's created a lot of these problems. The obvious uh, follow up. I recently uh, interviewed uh, Richard Kallenberg, who's the you know center left, but he's like very aggressively anti race based affirmative action, much more on the class centric one. His contention is that with a class focus you can still accomplish a lot of like the diversity goals that you're articulating from a reflecting society perspective. Like, Where do you come um, down on the class-based focus when it comes to educational um, attainment and admissions debate? So as I say, the, the key to me I, you know, is what will get us to the result that we're looking for, which is a class that really reflects the diversity of the society. And you know, I don't think you have to use race. I, I, and if class worked, but it, as long as it produced that, that would be fine. You know, I mean, I think we can give institutions some flexibility to figure out what does do that, which is what we used to, what we've been doing, um, and you know, and so on. So, as I say, I think the debate gets framed differently when you start from some notion that the entitlement comes with grades and test scores, and anything you're doing within that that sort of takes away from it is deeply suspect and needs to be challenged. And then particularly certain kinds of things like using race because of the history of using race becomes you know, problematic. That is different if we start from the position that what's important is that the class you're putting together look like the society for which you're educating it. And now what tools will get us there? And of course, we want you know students who are capable and they learn from each other so much. So the more, the better. But it's a sort of secondary consideration and not the primary. You know, for this, for this last section, I kind of want to play with... Uh a piece you wrote um, on you know Hewlett's website in the newsletter um, where you're saying we need to talk about capitalism and you know as someone who's talked about capitalism for almost four years on this podcast like my kind of like modification of that is we've talked about capitalism or I've talked about capitalism now what you've pointed out that you think here neoliberal, neoliberalism as a paradigm um, no longer operates however the successors, um, have not emerged. 
so to go to the start of the episode, you know, we have neoliberalism doesn't work, end state is post neoliberalism, but we're in this middle that's ill defined. To the degree you can, how would you? Def- what are some interesting? mixing too many metaphors, what are some little shoots that are coming out of the ground that constitute your optimism about the middle part of this? Yeah. And so again, to step back, the idea in that piece was to say one of the great successes of neoliberalism was a rhetorical success, which was equating their particular version of capitalism with capitalism itself, so that anything that was a departure from it could be labeled you know, as anti-capitalist or not capitalist. So I wanted to start by, let's step back And what do we mean by capitalism? And as I say, for me, it's easier to think about it as it's basically a commitment to a free enterprise system in which most of the economic activity within the society is is private. Um, But after that, we can mix and match other pieces as best suits the goals that we want to achieve as a society. So, you know, FDR's New Deal was a system of capitalism. Keynes was a system of capitalism. The social democracies in Scandinavia are systems of capitalism. They're all different. And let's recreate the space so that we're not like pejoratively sort of putting off, you know, because those labels can matter for what people understand. So that's that's the important point. So what do I see as shoots that are emerging? You know, I mean, there's lots of interesting things happening on. One of the most accessible and easiest ones is, you know, the Paul Pearson Jacob Hacker stuff about pre-distribution. So this fits that notion that we care about the distribution of wealth. And the and it's not like, you know, neoliberals were completely oblivious to that, but their idea was have these super free markets, let growth rip. And then to the extent that you have a really big problem, use redistribution after the fact. And the frame of that then basically says to people, you earn this and we're going to take a big chunk of it away from you. And we're going to give it to somebody else because we care about like, you know, not having the society fall apart. And the pre-distribution notion says, no, look, markets are constructed by government. You, those free markets, that was the difference between neoliberals and laissez-faire liberals of the 19th century. Like government had an important role in showing a particular version of markets. They had it produced a particular set of outcomes, predictably. And once we know that, then we can actually structure our markets differently so that we're still relying heavily on the free enterprise system, but we've structured it in a way that it's going to produce a better distribution itself. So we don't have to redistribute. We've effectively pre-distributed by the way we structured our markets. So you can have a different kind of antitrust law than the one that we have. You can have a different kind of labor law than the one that we have. You can have a different kind of corporate law than the one we have that will do that. So we're not going to say the sole purpose of the corporation is maximizing shareholder wealth. That produces bad consequences. Let's think about other stakeholders. Still a corporation, you know, it's still figuring out what to do, but they're doing it within a slightly different frame. Let's have an antitrust law that isn't focused only on prices and consumer benefits that thinks about, because uh, yes, I'm a consumer, but I'm also a worker and I'm a citizen. And let's think about the different identities in particular. We know that massive aggregations of economic wealth, even if it produces lower prices, produces political power and that distorts the system. That was the original understanding of NHS. Let's rethink that so that we don't have those distortions. And, you know, and as it let's, we know that labor needs a, a voice, you know, now how to construct it is, I think, an open question. 20th century labor unions, which were defined for an industrial economy, which had massive numbers of workers in plants doing similar work, don't necessarily make sense for the 21st century economy. So we need to rethink how do we give a proper voice to labor as against, because we're still within a capitalist system, you know, Mm -hmm. so that that balance is better. So those are all the pieces that hopefully at some point will gel into a post-neoliberal, a different version. I don't even want to call post-neoliberal unless neoliberalism is just post-Keynesian, right? Mm -hmm. Or Keynesianism is just post-laissez-faire. So into a new paradigm that, that works for people because it produces outcomes that make sense to them. That uh, callback you made to the 20th century brings to mind a, a question I have, which is, what is the role of nostalgia or looking towards the future when you're trying to make arguments about some version of the political or economic good? Um, so, for, for example, um, you'll see people to the right give one argument why the 50s were great, so people to the left harken back to another version of the 1950s. To what degree does harkening back to that past and this is different from the debate of where things really. This is separate from the where things really that good because it's an idea, right? So yeah, yeah. if you're if you're Bernie Sanders, the fifties, you're talking about the idea 
of you know labor unions, factory employment, et cetera. If you're on the right, you're talking about um, specific social arrangements. Are we hampered by thinking of the by being rooted in the past and needing to move forward? How do you think about this? So I think we always have to look at the past in order to understand how to get to the future. That's and we're fighting about the history all the time and how to interpret the past. I would you view nostalgia as the label that we put on a particular way of looking at the past, which is through rose-tinted glasses, and that can happen on on either side. Um, so it's not that. So so what I would say is, so there is some nostalgia. Um, you know, there are people who look at the past and say, we want to restore that and don't pay any attention to the horrible sides of it. But that's a different point than um, we we need to look at and understand the past in order to understand where we are how we got here and then think then intelligently about how we can get somewhere else, right? American society is different from French society or British society. If we don't understand how we got to where we are and what has shaped us, if we pretend that it's the same, we're much more likely to, to make mistakes in thinking about our own future. Nostalgia would be some notion of we're bound in stock to just redo things or restore things. Sometimes restoration may make sense. Sometimes it doesn't. You're never restoring something because the context will always have changed. So it's more like it's think of it this way. I, I used to say history is just a form of um, I can study French culture today and compare it to America. I can study American culture 100 years ago and compare it to America today. Those are both similar kinds of things. Neither of them is what we are today. I can learn from both of them. I need to understand where and why the differences are. Um, I had a conversation once with somebody where, you know, I think appeal to traditional American values, but, or the, that's, I don't want to frame it that way, appeal to the values that underlay, that have underlay um, our constitution and our society all along, um, I think is, it remains important and powerful for people. Um, and it's a mistake to reject all that because it has had really bad consequences or allowed things to happen that were really awful. Um, but it's also a mistake to ignore the really bad things and the really awful things. So it's like those values are still wonderful motivators today. And how do we implement them in our world to do better than we did in the past? And if there's anything that's American, you know, it is that. It's that notion that we can always do better, that we can always improve, that, you know, that we can make a more perfect union. That's a deep American value. That's not nostalgia. But nostalgia would be to say, actually, they had it right then. And what we need to do is just go back to that with all of its bad consequences. Yeah, I like the focus on um, the pitfalls of just pure restoration. So for the final question here, uh, I'd, I'd love kind of for a, a bit of a call to action. What are some unanswered questions or open opportunity for work that you see? So if one of these initial shoots is this pre-distribution idea, what are some other open questions or ideas that you think folks should be working on to advance this conversation? I think the biggest challenge is the challenge of figuring out how to talk about race and move forward on race in a productive way. Um, and we're not having a productive conversation left or right about it now. To, to, it has been a critical moving issue across American history from the very beginning. I think about that. There's no question. It doesn't file, you know, so what we need to do is move away from the debate we have now, which is a zero sum debate. That either requires, you know, treating it as an either or choice or ignoring and into a debate that recognizes where the similarities are, but also where the differences are so that we can address those as part of a solution. Right. So there are ways in which neoliberalism has failed everybody. And there are ways in which the ways in which it has failed certain groups are different and distinct. And we need to hold both of those things while recognizing what we're trying to do is make it better for everybody. And we don't yet have a way to talk about that. Um, and I, so I, I view that as a, as a really as a really significant challenge um, for this debate going forward. And then, you know, I think there are all sorts of like, and almost like we talked about labor quickly. I don't have an answer to that. I don't think we've yet come up with one, you know. Um, and, and, you know, um, we're feeling our way through a new industrial policy, um, like, how does it work and what are the economic consequences actually going to be? I mean, we're, we're in the middle of an experiment, but that's always the way these things, these things go. So in some sense, there's nothing but open questions. Um, and we need to kind of push for ideas and see which ones work. Um, and, and at the same time, being able to explain them. So 
um, I don't think it's so much like there's the following three questions as um, we're in this period where lots of stuff is up for grabs. We have a wide a kind of potpourri of individual policy solutions, which are well worth trying. Mm -hmm. Not yet a kind of overarching story that puts them together or puts a bunch of them together in ways that will be compelling for citizens in ordinary citizens so that they want to try it and then see if it works. And then if it works, move on from there. That is an excellent place to leave it. Larry Kramer, thank you for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you. It's been super interesting. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me.